Hey, good morning to all of you. We're uh, in the month of May, and it's a great start weather-wise, isn't it? Uh, we're going to use this whole month to teach uh, on a topic called One Another. It's a new series here after just finishing up our April series, and it really is a great series to follow what we did around the theme of Easter. We had been mentioning all last month that Jesus had made a number of appearances to his disciples. Um, we recognize about 13 different appearances, both to his committed followers and also to others. I pointed out last week that the Lord's last words in all four of the gospel accounts and early in the book of Acts uh, was regarding the subject of sharing our faith, talking about the story of the resurrection. Jesus in Matthew talked about going out and making disciples of all nations. In other words, telling people about Jesus and bringing them in uh, as people who've placed their faith in Christ and also committed now to his local church. Following all of those instructions, he told his um, followers, now, listen, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. I want you to hang out there for a while. It won't be a long period of time, but I want you to go back. And there's something called the Holy Spirit that's going to come. I, don't, I want you to do this mission, make disciples, but the Holy Spirit's going to do two things for you. And through the teaching of the Lord, they understood that the Holy Spirit was going to take up residence in their life. We as Christians call that the indwelling of the Spirit. It was going to help them grow, help them understand His Word, but also bond together. So the indwelling was critical. That's why they had to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. The second aspect was the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit was to give them a boldness to share their faith in very difficult situations, to share their faith as they went all around the world. Oftentimes, uh, we see the disciples in the book of Acts, uh, they're being persecuted, but yet with great boldness, they go out. So the Holy Spirit's role was to do the indwelling and the filling, two different aspects in order to complete the mission of making disciples. His purpose is, was very simple. He was to take this ragtag group of believers and to make them into a community, to make them uh, like-minded so that they would support and encourage each other, but also be very determined in this aspect of making disciples. Jesus called this the church. The word church literally means a called out assembly, a called out community of people from the larger group of people. If you were to go to the book of Acts chapter 2, this is after the Holy Spirit has come now. In Acts 2 verse 42 through 47, we get a great picture of what the early church was like. I like to think that's our model as Christians. This is the way the church is supposed to function. We're supposed to get along. We're supposed to reach out and meet the needs of people, not only in our group, our, uh, our community of believers, but also in our community at large. And then we are to uh, share our faith with others, bring people into uh, the local church, people who put their faith and trust in Christ and help them grow. That's the church. Now, throughout the epistles of Paul, the letters or the writings of Paul that follow the book of Acts, we see that the church is referenced to not just as a community, but a family, a family of believers. Now, think about the word family. There are many, many different types of families. We know the traditional nuclear family, mom, dad, 2.3 kids, dog, and a cat. But there are other types of families, and we're very aware of that in our culture. So there's all kinds of families, but here's what I've noticed about families wherever I've traveled in the world. All families have rules. Now, these rules may be written rarely, but they're sometimes written. Most often, they're just clearly <laughs> understood or clearly misunderstood. They're communicated verbally, and if they're not communicated verbally on a, on a very regular basis, it tends to break down. But all families have expectations. All families have rules whereby they function. Now, those rules may <laughs> make no sense to anyone else. They may not even make sense to the parents of the party that's married. But the rules that the family has chosen to live by, the rules that they intend to pass on to their children, without rules in our culture, 
culture tends to break down because of the sinful nature, the selfish nature of mankind. Now, we know some rules can be very arbitrary. They can be imposed. They can be dogmatic. Uh, and nobody likes rules that are oppressive. But when rules or guidelines are for the betterment of all people involved, we tend to get along well. And society tends to operate really well. Now, what are your family rules? One of the questions I'm going to have you think about throughout the week is, what are your family rules? What are the guidelines, if you don't like the word rules? What are the expectations that you have whereby you get along? Now, in our uh, home, Evie and I, we have some rules, we have some expectations, and they're not written down. It's understood. Evie takes care of the house. I take care of the exterior. Now, do we both share sometimes? Of course you do. If you care about people and you want everybody to get along, you oftentimes help out. But there's some rules that we have that I'm sure that you have in your own home. Now, as I thought about families in our church, I want to just show you some of the rules that some of the families in our church have. Now, many of you know the Lyles family and the Berry family. They're great people. They have some unwritten rules. Maybe these are printed down. I've got a copy of what I think their rules are. But here are the rules for the Berry family and the Lyles family. Here's an example. Always tell the truth. Work hard. Keep your promises. Laugh out loud. Always say to one another and to those in the family, I love you. Do your best. Be proud of yourself. Say please and thank you. And remember, you are loved. Now, aren't those great rules? I think we would all like to have a family that operated by those. Now, some families operate a little bit differently. They still care about each other just as much as, as the families I just mentioned. But they tend to be a little bit more straightforward. They tend to cut to the chase. And here's an example of what the Shills family Tim and Stacy and the Maders, Joe and Emily, but I also think Mike and Heidi Mater could get along with these rules too. Here's an example. If you sleep on it, make it up. If you step on it, <laughs> wipe it up. If you wear it, hang it up. If you drop it, pick it up. If you eat out of it, wash it up. If it rings, answer it. And if it howls, feed it. Now, the, some of our families operate this way. It's very simple. Very, uh, There's no frills. But then there's some of our families that are just a bit different. And they're different not because they're necessarily weird, but the amount of children that they have make them weird. Uh, each of these families have like their own basketball team or more of children. And here's how they get along. We're, I'm thinking of the Dentons, I'm thinking of the Byers, and I'm thinking of the Stevens family. Multiple children. You and I may look at them and we scratch our heads and we say they're dysfunctional. For example, chew with your mouth open. Jump on the bed. Have you ever gone to these people's homes? Slam doors. Use your outside voice inside. Make a mess. Embarrass each other in public. Eat dessert first have good fights, disregard good advice, and blame the dog. Now, do these families really operate by these rules? A little bit. And I think all these families kind of mingle those. What are your family rules? How do you get along? What makes you function well? Our Father in Heaven has desired that you and I as Christians, that we grow together that we share common values, that we carry out the tasks that he's entrusted to us. And I think in the process of that, our Father in Heaven wants you and I as Christians to play nice. We use that term here at Grace a lot. Our Father wants us to encourage each other, to support one another, to care for one another. Did you catch the word, the phrase there, one another? That phrase, one another, is the title of our series for this month. It's used some 100 times in the New Testament, depending on your version of the Bible. Here's an example. Love one another. Have you ever heard that? Forgive one another. Encourage one another. And the list goes on and on and on. They're God's instructions to us. And not only his instructions, these are his expectations 
for those of us that call ourselves Christ followers. Those of us here at Grace, that's what he expects of us. And learning God's intent behind all of those phrases and actually applying them to our lives and our behavior, both in the church and out of the church, it will make a radical difference in your life, but also in our relationships with each other, within our homes, and surely within our community. Now, in this series, because there's about a hundred of these, and they're, sometimes they're repeated, uh, one particular command could be repeated a number of times, we're not going to be able to cover all of them, though. We can't cover them all during the month of May. But it's used a hundred times. Think about that. It must be important for the Lord to use that phrase, one another, one another, one another, over and over again. The first one another that we're going to talk about is really the one that's given to us first in this complete list. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. So I'm going to have you turn there. John 13, the, uh, the phrase one another comes right from the mouth of Jesus. So while you're turning there, I'm going to grab a sip of water. And here's what Jesus says to us in John 13, verse 34 through 35. These words are love one another. We'll come to that in just a moment. It reflects our true relationship with God. This is what Jesus explained to us. The way that we as Christians behave in our community, in our home groups, in our classes, in our ministries, and in our attendance at church, it reflects our real relationship with God. If we can't get along here, the rest of the world looks at us and says, you're hypocrites. We're hypocrites. The way we practice the one another is critical to our witness to others. It serves as an evidence of our relationship with others, both in here and outside of these walls. And it empowers us, the family of God, to grow together, to mature in our faith, and to get along. One another's are critical. They're evidence of the reality of our faith. By putting them into practice, we grow into the church, into the family that God wants us to be. Now, depending on your version of the Bible, you'll find in, um, there's at least a dozen, 12, love one another's in the New Testament. Now, I'm using the NIV, and I counted them again this morning. There's 12 different times the phrase, love one another, is used. There is a half a dozen times, six times, where we see the phrase, love each other, very similar. And then there's another dozen times where the word love in the phrase one another is used in the same verse, just not connected together. It seems to be rather important for the Lord to mention this. Okay? The first time we see it is in John 13, 34, 35, so hopefully you found that. Just before the Lord says these words, love one another, and he says it a couple of times, he has gotten, he has had a meal uh, with his disciples. And as all of his disciples came into the gathering place, they've been walking, their feet are hot, they're dirty, they're dusty. Normally in the Jewish culture, there would be a servant at the door who then would kneel down, would have a bowl in a rag, some warm water, and he would wash the feet of the honored guests coming in. That was the custom in the Middle East. Nobody does that today in America, but that was the custom then. And as they all came in, they're looking around, where's the servant? Where's the servant? None of them thought, hey, I will wash the feet of my friends here, especially the feet of my Lord. Nobody thought that. Jesus knelt down and he taught him a very valuable lesson. Just before he uttered the words, you must love one another. He gave them a visual demonstration of what it means to love one another. He knew that love has to be acted out. Love in its essence is doing something unconditionally for the betterment of another person or group of people. It's not simply words. Words have to have a corresponding action for it to mean something. Jesus is getting ready to die, and yet he's thinking of other people. And he says in verse 34 of chapter 13 in John, a new command, notice, a new command I give you. It's really not a new command, 
because in the Old Testament, it oftentimes talked about the, uh, illustrating the fact that God loves us, we're to play nice, we're to get along. But Jesus is summing up all of the law for his disciples. A new command, let me boil it down, he might say, and give, and give this to you. Love one another. And then he says this, as I have loved you. Remember what he just did. He hasn't died yet. What he's just done is he's washed their feet. What he's done is treated them not only as equals, but better than himself. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Notice he doesn't say, if you feel like it, you can treat others this way. If you've got time, if they're of the same race, the same um, a political party, uh, etc. No, he said, you must love one another. That was the defining um, picture of what the early church was like. When they had plagues, when they had diseases, when they were being persecuted, it was the Christians who reached out to others because they practiced that within their own community. Verse 35, by this everyone, everyone will know that you are my disciples. They don't, people out in the world today don't care if you go to a Baptist church, a Methodist church, to Grace Church, doesn't matter. They don't care about the church you go to. What they care about is this, do you really love people? And let's take a look at you, they're saying. Let us look at your congregation. Let us look at your family. Let's look at your relationships. Verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Notice the word if. Not if you say it, but if you do it. And he, remember the practical demonstration. Humbling ourselves, caring for others, putting their needs ahead of our own, not demanding our own way. Later, he repeated the phrase. A couple chapters later in John 15, he repeats it twice. And there it is a definite command. That's the Lord's expectation today as we start this series on one another's. The word that the Lord uses for love, many of us have heard this, it's the word agape. In that culture, it represented the very highest form of love. It was only the type of love that a person could dream of. It's a type of love of a holy God for a sinful for sinful humanity. In other words, it's the kind of love we would have for somebody who wrongs us, somebody who speaks evil of us, and we still care about them, we still serve them. That's the kind of love most of us rarely, if ever, have experienced. But that was the word that the Lord used here. You must agape one another. Care about them no matter what. It represented a universal and unconditional type of love. It transcends any circumstance. It goes way above, way beyond. And it's beyond emotions. Biblical love is not necessarily an emotional reaction to somebody. It's not ooey, it's not gooey. It seeks the best of someone else. As a result of that, it does something practically. That's biblical love from the mouth of Jesus. The very best definition of love that's given in Scripture is John 3.16. Most famous verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave. God loved, he gave. That whosoever believes in him should never perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God loved the world whether we accept him or not. He still loves us enough to, uh, to give his son on behalf of our sin penalty. That's real love. Biblical love is found in servanthood. Biblical love is found in sacrifice. And biblical love is found in selfless living. If you belong to a congregation, you're involved in a, in a congregation, there's a difference between just attending and belonging. If you belong, you shoulder part of the responsibilities. You prayerfully, financially, and physically support the work of that ministry if you truly are a part of the family of God. In America, we've gotten to the point where 
where about half the people who attend church would say this is their family, this is their church, but they do nothing. And that just makes no sense. We wouldn't tolerate that in our natural families, I don't think. But yet, for many people who call themselves churchgoers, that's exactly how they function. They're involved in no ministry. They never take part in a home group. They're not serving. They don't prayerfully support a ministry. And you've got to ask yourself, what kind of family member would do such a thing? Here at Grace, we really work hard to help people practice this aspect of love, love one another. Our goal is to help people honor God and to help other people. So, <clears throat> and to reach out to those who don't know Christ so that they can have a real relationship with the Lord. One of the resources we use here at Grace, a primary teaching resource is a book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. He is a noted Christian author and counselor who studied human behavior for 30 plus years. He's concluded that people express their emotions, express their inner thoughts in five basic ways, how they care about other people. And he, his book, Love Languages, deals with five love, five love languages. Basically, he's saying this, when we care about people, we tend to express it in five ways. Now, each of those ways breaks down into, into sub-areas. But the five primary areas are this, in our words. Those words could be vocal. Those words could be written. But if we care about people, some of us, our primary love language is to verbally or in a written format express that to someone else. Secondly, there's time, and we would argue in America, both quantity and quality time. Spending time with people, not necessarily looking at our watch the whole time, but we spend time. Secondly, or third aspect, is giving of uh, gifts or resources or material um, in a material form of way. We tend to give. We know somebody likes a particular gift or they see something that they like, so we might go out of our way and purchase it, or somehow work out a way in which that person can receive that gift. A fourth way of expressing love is acts of service. You go out and you do something physically. You may wash their car, you could uh, wash the dishes, you could vacuum the floor, whatever it may be. All of those things are things that need to be done. So when it becomes an act of love, you do it for somebody else, for the family, for a loved one, for a friend, so that they don't have to do it. You show your love to them by doing that act of service. And the fifth aspect is very important, especially in American culture. And what we've been going through here in America for the last two years, or excuse me, two months, has really infringed upon this love language because there's those of us who are physical. We show love and appreciation to people by touch and by proximity, by being close to them or touching them. It could be a shake of their hand, could be a pat on the back, ruffle of their hair, could be a hug. Many people in our church have commented, you miss that. Why? Because it's a love language. That's the way you like to receive love and or give love. Now, think about this. In our world today, there's, there's some basic language groups. All of them have subcategories, but they tend to be the basic languages of our world. Now, in a, the English language, whether it's American or whether it's British or uh, Canadian or Australian, many countries speak some version of English. Uh, Americans are not the only ones who have the right to that language. Um, English is one of those languages primary language. In fact, it's the number one business language on planet Earth. But then there's a the Japanese language. There's Chinese. And within the Chinese language, as we might call it, there could be different subcategories of Chinese. There's Spanish. There's Portuguese. There's Greek. There's French. All of those are primary languages. Some, of, some languages are connected. But there's Arabic also. 
if you go to Africa, there's about eight to ten major languages just in Africa, Arabic being one of the primary. But Swahili, Habari, I, think, I hope I said it right, means hi in Swahili. So there are major languages that we grow up learning, depending on where you live. Depending on your nationality, depending upon what your parents taught you, it becomes our primary, or we might say our native language. Later on, we may, in your uh, lifetime, learn a second language. I remember being in sixth grade watching Spanish on TV, and that's how we learned it. Uh, uno, dos, tres, cuatro. That's about all I remember from my uh, half a semester of Spanish. You can learn a secondary language or more, but you often find out it's, for many people, it's very difficult the older that you get. Some of us just have a heck of a time mastering our own primary language. <clears throat> As you learn your major language, you will often encounter people, if you travel at all, who speak another major language. Because I travel, I've met a number of people that will speak other languages. It's different than yours. And communication can be very difficult if, if the two people only speak a primary language. You end up like this, if you're thirsty, going... Because about ten times you said water, the person's just shrugging their shoulders. There are primary languages, and if we don't understand the primary language of another person, there's going to be conflict. If we're going to communicate effectively across cultural lines in today's world, we have to learn the language of others. Now, the Internet has made that more of a reality. But physically, you could travel around the world and be totally lost. You will go to some countries, and they may know English, but they're not going to speak it to you because they want to give you a hard time. Communication is critical. Knowing languages is critical. And as we talk about uh, Chapman's book, L Five Love Languages, <clears throat> we have to understand what he means if we're going to get along as Christians, if we're going to have a good family dynamic here at Grace or in any church. Your emotional love language, okay, in the language of others can be as different as Chinese and English. We have to work hard at knowing someone else's love language, but also be able to express in a um, better way our own. As we look at the life of Christ, we see that Jesus demonstrated and operated with all five of the love languages that Chapman points out in his book, both in his relationship with God and in his relationship with people. For example, you take the issue of words. He spoke to people, but he also what? He spoke to his father. He listened to people, and he also listened to his father. All of these love languages are multifaceted but there's five basic ones. Today, we can't deal with all five love languages. If we're, and remember, we're talking about love one another. There's five primary functions. We can't look at all five, but we're going to look at one. And this one is, the one is probably the one that's most abused, most misused, most excused, and most confused. And it's the first one we talked about. It's our words, the way that we speak to one another. Whether we're face-to-face, -face, whether it's audio, just like many of you, you're listening to me today, or it's written, the stuff that we text. And I think anybody who uses Facebook or any of the means of social uh, communication, you have learned you could type something out to somebody and they can totally miss what you're saying or misconstrue what you're saying. Words are important. King Solomon, known as probably one of the wisest men who's ever lived, said this in Proverbs 18.21. The tongue, your mouth, has the power of life and the power of death. All of us can relate to times when we've been wounded and hurt by the words of another person. Now, we all know sticks and stones may what? Yeah, break my bones, but yeah, that would be a fallacy. 
words do hurt. Words do hurt. And we as churchgoers, we here at Grace, have to learn to use words better. We have to get better in this way of speaking to one another. Why? Because this is the way the world looks at us and says, is there any reality of your faith? They listen to how we say things and about who we say things regarding. So the world listens to us talk with them at work or at school or in the marketplace. And they've got to be wondering, if that's how you speak here, how do you speak there, meaning church? We know in every language there's dialects, variations of the major language with slight differences, sometimes major differences, that even in a group of English-speaking people, you could listen to somebody say something, and it, whether it's an accent, but a dialect, it's a different way of using the word, a different tone to the word. For example, have any of you been in Louisiana and listened to their version of Louisiana French? It's called what? Uh-huh, Cajun. I've watched some shows about people who are hunting alligators or fishing in Louisiana as they speak. My wife and I, we look at each other and we think, what language are they speaking? It's English. It's a small dialect of English. As we think about love languages, especially words, in words there are different dialects, different versions of how we use the words that will make or break a relationship. And if we're going to act like God's family, if we're going to be a tight-knit group uh, of people, if we're going to be a community that functions well together, that plays nice and is driven by a common mission, then you and I have to grow in our ability to use words wisely and learn to speak to others in a way that they can understand us, but also in a way that makes us understandable. So I want to give you seven dialects today. Ways of using words. You may say my primary love language is talking. It's being audible. It's by typing. It's by words. But generally, we may speak a particular dialect or two out of these seven. And what we've got to understand, words is a broad category. And if we're going to work on something at, at Grace during the month of uh, May, it's going to be used all seven dialects and try to be better at the ones in which we're not using them or try to improve our ability in these seven areas. First of all is the dialect of appreciation. The dialect of appreciation, I think, in your notes there, you could write that down. Saying things like, thank you, a heartfelt thank you, I am grateful. I really appreciate you or that. Saying things like, I'm so glad. All of those are forms of a dialect of appreciation. They're, it's letting people know what in your heart you feel. Some people aren't as verbal as others. And they may feel, they may feel a sense of gratitude, but they never express it. But if the person in your family or the person at work or the person who waits on you in a restaurant, etc., whenever we get back to that, if their language is, uh, their primary love language is words, they begin to think you don't care, that they're not valued. They could actually become bitter, feel that they're being misused if we don't learn to be more grateful. So the dialect of appreciation. This week, practice that with people in your family, in your community, in your church. Second form of using words, another dialect, is that of attention. Attention. When we stop, to take time out of our day to recognize people's accomplishments, their achievements, the special days like a birthday or an anniversary, and I love the fact that Leslie Boer, our church administrator, uh, post stuff all the time when it's somebody's birthday or somebody's anniversary. That's what we're talking about. It's a dialect of attention. We let them know that their life, their effort, they as a person really matter. And we recognize that and we support them in that area. 
it tells somebody they have meaning. What they've done or what they've achieved matters. Now, this past week on the, on the 29th of April, uh, my first wife, Sherry, who passed away, you all know that, she and I on the 29th of April would have been married 48 years. 48 years. That's quite a milestone. And I just saw that Jill Lynn um, Boldry's parents celebrated their 50th anniversary. When we take time to point that out, pay attention to those little details, it really matters. It tells somebody that they and their family matter. Third dialect is that of, a, is that of affection. This is probably the most overused dialect in the, in the verbal category to the point where some phrases, some words actually have lost meaning or it's been blurred. The most common way of showing affection is what? I love you. But the problem is I love hot dogs too. And I love the Dallas Cowboys. And what do you love? When we use that word I love for a food, for a pro team, for some hobby, for your dog, for your cat, for your child, your spouse, and your parents, doesn't it just not carry the same weight? Isn't it kind of blurred out? We ought to keep the word love for the word love. Showing our emotional connection to somebody. Showing that we really care about them. I don't know that we can ever rewire our mouth that way. But I know when we have a very secular, anti-God media industry that throws the word love around for all sorts of things, it dumbs down what God said in John 3.16, for, or what Jesus said, for God so what? God so agape the world totally committed, more committed to somebody, something than what they deserve or could ever experience, regardless of the circumstances. The word love should be, we'll use the Christian word, holy. It should be set apart. It shouldn't be used that often for things that you may simply like. Because if you love, you're 100% committed no matter what no matter what. Fourth dialect, verbally speaking, is the dialect of apology. And I think that tells you what I'm getting at. To apologize means to, ex to understand hurt, to be empathetic, to know that you've done something, said something, uh, neglected to do something or say something, and showing real remorse and sorrow for a wrong or an injury done to somebody else. I hate the phrase, my bad. Don't ever say that to me, I'll smack you. <laughs> it really does not convey any remorse, any sorrow, any degree of understanding the hurt or the wound. The dialect of apology. Some of us can grow in that area. There are some people that just cannot admit that they're wrong that they've caused wound, they want a wound to somebody. They blame everybody and everything but the, their own actions. So there's some of us here at Grace, some of us listening to this, that can grow in that dialect. Another dialect is the dialect of affirmation. To affirm somebody means to declare that something is true, that you are supportive of somebody or something. We can use this dialect when we point out things that are right, when things are true. When another person has done something well, we affirm that. It means to compliment somebody, but not just flatter them or suck up to them. It's when you recognize something good and you point that out and say, you did a great job on that. And I always have believed that we should point out people's character more than their competency. Some people are just born with a certain ability and they can do it with very little thought. But it's the character behind something. 
So rather than say, hey, you did a good job, which sometimes need to be said, we maybe need to point out better the character. Hey, when you completed that task, I loved your determination. I love the fact that you were cheerful, even though I know you didn't like to do the job. You got the job done. What I value more than that is the attitude in which you did it. The dialect of affirmation. Another dialect is a dialect of advancement. Advancement. The idea of urging somebody on, that's what the word advancement means, to encourage them to do something. It's cheering a person on. You and I can do a better job encouraging others to do a job and to do a job well. It's saying things like, I believe in you. I'm behind you. How can I help you? You can do that. All of those are ways of encouraging a person in the sense of advancement, getting the job done and moving on through the sticking points. All of us in, nowadays on Facebook anyway, if not on the mainline news, you're hearing how people are actually suffering at home. Aloneness, feeling a, a disconnected. Sometimes a few people just need to be encouraged, this idea of advancement, saying, come on, you can get through this. The last dialect is that of admonishment. And sometimes for some families, you use too much of this. To admonish is to caution. It's to advise. It's to warn somebody about something that potentially could be harmful to them and to others. You and I sometimes take this dialect of admonishment and we make it a dialect of criticism. Nobody needs criticism. They need to, some instruction. So while I'm not saying we should never say uh, or point out anything wrong in somebody's life, what I'm saying is be cautious how you do that and give constructive criticism. Don't just tell somebody they did a job bad or poorly unless you're willing to point out a different way of doing that or asking the question like, Have you, did you consider any other alternatives to what you just did? Let me suggest something. Or even asking if you could suggest something to them. Have you ever, those of us that are adults or have our driver's license, have you ever been driving down the road with somebody and then all of a sudden they say, watch out? We, we panic. We start hitting the brake. We're, our head jerks around. And a person is admonishing you. They're giving you constructive criticism. They're helping you, not necessarily criticizing you. Sometimes that can make people angry. But really, what's the alternative? Hitting that deer, going off the side of the road, taking out a mailbox, or getting a ticket? We have to appreciate the fact that in our family, our natural family, and in our church family, there are those who love you, those who care about you, those who want the best for you, and occasionally they're going to admonish you. You and I have to be mature enough to appreciate that, to accept that. And understand, the only reason the person is saying this, because they have your best interest, and in a case of driving, maybe their own safety as a concern. What are we talking about today? Love one another. Gary Chapman points out five love languages. The first love language is simply words, and that's what we focused on today. Um, words have the ability to really help us, they have the ability to hurt us. As Christ followers, we have to do a little bit better job in communicating the words to other people and be cautious of the words that we say to others. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, the Apostle Paul picks up on what Jesus has said, love one another, understanding the power of words. The Apostle Paul says this, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Paul says, do not let, which implies this, you have control. All of us, I think, have been to the point where we pointed a finger at somebody and said, you make me so mad. It's your fault. Paul says this, do not let. In other words, you have control over this. 
not somebody else. It's up to you. Do not let, Paul says, any, doesn't say some, says any, unwholesome talk. For a moment, think in your own mind. What is unwholesome talk to you? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. I have no control over what you say. I have all the world or all the control in the world over what I say. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Remember, he's speaking to a church. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And the last part of that verse, that it may benefit those who listen. All of us can rationalize our words, and the vast majority of us are wrong. Well, you just needed to hear my criticism. No, we need to build somebody up so that it actually benefits them, not you getting it off your chest. Read Paul's words again with me, Ephesians 4, 29. Do not say those words to yourself. Let any unwholesome talk, say it, come out of your mouth. Say this but only what is helpful, say it, for building others up according to their needs, not yours, according to their needs, say those words, that it may benefit those who listen. This is a good passage that should be memorized. Not only Jesus' words in John 13, 34, and 35, but Paul's words here in Ephesians 4 and 29. If you and I can work on the way we talk, work on our mouth, work on our speech, in these seven areas, and that includes the things we type in response to what we consider the stupidity of others in social media. Maybe you don't need to type any words. Maybe you just need to let it go. If we improve in our speech, Jesus said this, then others will know that you're my disciples. Father, for the gift of words, we thank you. It's because of words we know you. It's because of words uh, we understand how you would have us to uh, be saved, how you would have us to live, and how we can take the message about Christ out into our world today. Help us to speak better. Help us to be kinder. We've all got room to grow in this. So this week, we are going to practice this love language of words in these seven dialects. We ask you to work through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.